Around 1350 BCE, ancient Egypt had undergone both an art and religious revolution, all thanks to one man, Akhenaten. So, who was this guy? Son of Pharaoh Amenhotep III, Akhenaten was in co-regency with his father for the last years of the latter's life. Akhenaten came to sovereign power after his father passed away in 1353 BCE of Egypt's 18th dynasty in the New Kingdom. During Amenhotep III's reign, which was 1386 to 1351 BCE, Egypt stayed consistent with their polytheistic beliefs and serious royal art styles. However, there was one god that was lord of all and received significantly more praise than the rest, especially in ancient Egypt's capital, Thebes. And this god's name was Amun. In fact, before Akhenaten came to be, he was previously known as Amenhotep IV, his name meaning Amun is satisfied. Akhenaten, on the other hand, wasn't satisfied. He did carry out his father's beliefs for a bit, but about five years into his reign, the religious revolution had begun. Akhenaten began publicly devoting his life to the deity Aten and pushed for monotheism within Egypt. Aten was an entity. Aten was a genderless sun disk. As mentioned before, Akhenaten changed his name from being Amenhotep to a name that meant of great use to Aten. Akhenaten also claimed himself to be the sun and soul prophet to Aten. To effectively put his beliefs to practice, he began reconstructing religious centers and architecture and monuments and sites. He even departed from Thebes and founded a city, today's Tel El Amarna, and named it after himself, Akhetaten, while also making it the new capital. This came to be the Amarna period. With a shift in religion came a shift in art. While ancient Egyptian art is unique for staying consistent, art of the Amarna period broke that streak. To further explain, I will be doing a speed drawing of a very famous artwork from that time. I'm recreating the stella of Akhenaten and his family. It is a relief stone carving of Akhenaten, Queen Nefertiti, and three daughters. As I sketch, keep an eye out for the significant differences between Amarna style art and previous ancient Egyptian art. Right off the bat, notice how this royal family is portrayed in a more humanizing manner, in contrast to the depictions of former rulers. As I sketch out the drawing, I realize that I'm using a lot of curved lines, ellipses, and running my pencil in a circular motion. There is no rigid posture among any of the figures. The Amarna style rejects formulaic art and instead exhibits fluidity. In this relief carving, Akhenaten's fatherhood is emphasized. As I'm drawing the hand, I want to take note of Akhenaten holding his daughter. He's supporting her head and embracing her tenderly. Most often, and before Akhenaten, pharaohs were recognized for their power, strength, wealth, and even divinity within art. Fatherhood and marriage were afterthoughts and deemed less important than a pharaoh's position of nation ruler. But artwork like this offers a sense of equality, like, hey, I may be the leader of this nation, but I'm a normal person too. However, what separates the pharaoh and the queen from subjects and regular civilians is the direct access and contact to Aten, the deity. In the background behind the family is the sun disk, shining its rays down. At the end of each ray is a hand. But the two rays closest to the ruling couple have an ankh at their ends, which is an Egyptian symbol for life. So, as the ankh hangs right above Akhenaten and Nefertiti's noses, it's as if Aten is breathing life into them both. Here is the finished sketch in comparison to the original limestone relief. Besides the iconography, I want to take a look at the stylization. Rather than the straight-lined, hard-edged, bold art that we know to be ancient Egyptian, all figures in this carving are depicted with roundness and curvature. Keeping the traditional style, the faces are shown as side profiles, but we are able to see more of their bodies. There's also less of a variation in line weight, less emphasis, and therefore more equal parts of this depiction of a ruler and his family. Besides the sun disk, no object pops out more than any other. The eyes, for example, are not bolded. They don't take on the symbolic eye of Horus. And that's probably to pay true honor to Aten. In addition to that, Akhenaten and Nefertiti are closely leveled and, at first glance, could be seen as duplicates. I'm not instantly drawn to one of them particularly. Instead, I have to figure out who is who. Previous sculptures and artworks of royal couples do not offer the same sense of equality. As you can see, the king's foot is always set forward. He is positioned to be in front of his wife. 
and the queen often seems to be in submission as she holds on to her husband and stays behind him. Moving on, I want to share another image of Akhenaten. This is his statue. It was excavated from the Temple of Aten in Karnak, Egypt, and was made sometime during his rule. It is made out of sandstone and stands 13 feet high. Notice how, rather than stiff and with a controlled demeanor, Akhenaten is depicted with curvature, plumpness, and line fluidity. His belly hangs out, his lips are full, and his face is carved very skinny. His shoulders are also slender as opposed to broad, and the shape of his body is curved. Art historians had initially speculated that this image of Akhenaten's body was a reflection of his physical health, but after further research, the historians concluded that this could possibly just be a manifestation of the Amarna style art. This may not be a correct representation of the human figure, but his more lax emotional appearance serves as a reflection of humanity. I mean, portrayals of former kings were much more intimidating. Take note of how Akhenaten is presented as well. With all of these observations regarding his body and physicality, you can see how he is appeared to be androgynous. Art historians have inferred that this could possibly have been a manifestation of the genderless sun disk through Akhenaten. Later art from the Amarna period continued to appear more naturalistic while lacking formality. Ancient Egyptian art has always paid homage to divine entities, the afterlife, royalty, or really anything greater than humanity. With Akhenaten's monotheistic religious revolution came an artistic revolution. Not only did the style change, but artwork soon solely honored Aten, whether that be directly or indirectly through Akhenaten, Aten's son and prophet. What's interesting, though, is the fact that this religious and artistic revolution only lasted for the period of Akhenaten's reign. Once the pharaoh died, Egypt reverted back to their traditional customs. Akhenaten was heavily criticized for his monotheistic beliefs and change in Egyptian culture. He was even nicknamed the heretic pharaoh. I understand ancient Egypt's pride in tradition and sameness, but I was particularly drawn to Akhenaten because of his quote-unquote rebellious energy. I like that he was different, and that he was unafraid to embrace his differences. I like that he was willing to break away from uniformity and familiarity. Unlike the pharaohs that preceded and succeeded him, I felt more relatable to Akhenaten. Besides claiming his position as son and prophet to Aten, Akhenaten was more person than royal figure. He had an approachable sense to him, and I'm grateful that his family time and the nature of his fatherhood had been documented.